Greetings to the most important event. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce everyone. Get them. T uh, I'm going to tell a little story after they've int after I've introduced them, and then they're going to each speak for a couple of minutes just on their on their reason for being here and their passion about driving about changing our drug driving laws. We've really those of you who've been here all day know we've been actually talking about them all day in the first session with Steve, and then my session on why we'll never ever change the drug laws, which was a little bit tongue in cheek, and. Uh, here we are now with another session on drug driving, but it is a really, really important issue. Up on stage, we have put up your hand as I as I go to you, Steve Bolt. Steve has been a practicing solicitor since 1991. He was blessed to write a book with me. No, I just made that bit up, but we did write a book together called Rough Deal, a plain English book about the New South Wales drug laws, and he's the author of a number of other publications. He also has represented countless numbers of people charged with drug driving laws before me, and he and I together cooked up a good defence of honest and reasonable mistake of fact. Tom Brown. Tom is, for, is the co-founder of Honolee, a patient advocate and digital marketer. Tom created Honolee to educate Australians about cannabis and improve access for those who can benefit from the plant. The um, Cannabis Law Reform Alliance, which is uh, Honolee's baby, has also given birth to the Drive Change campaign, which uh, uh, he and I have been working on with, with others uh, over the last few months. Welcome Tom, all the way from Melbourne. He does speak with an American accent, but he's actually an Aussie, so just ignore it. <laughs> David Shoebridge. David is a Greens MP in the New South Wales Parliament, serving the state's upper house since 2010. Um, he's the Green spokesman for, I'm not going to read out that list because it's very long, uh, but uh, before entering Parliament, David was a lawyer for 13 years, um, and last year he put up a bill to change the drug driving laws in New South Wales, which sadly was soundly defeated by both uh, Labor and the Coalition. Is that accurate? Yeah, well, I'll talk about that. You'll talk about that, that's great. Now, Robbie, uh, it was all males up here. Actually, Robbie Swan is not a male because he represents Fiona Patton um, from the Reason Party. Fiona in Victoria, they have a bill up before Parliament on uh, changing the drug driving laws, as well of as, of course, legalising cannabis. Um, and there is a committee, and that is why Fiona Patton can't be here and has instead sent her much better half, Robbie Swan, to talk about uh, the Reason Party and changing the drug driving laws. Finally, he says, we have Alex Wodak. Alex uh, is a physician who was the director of the alcohol, drug and alcohol service at St Vincent's Hospital from 1982 to 2012. He was a, a leader and outspoken person in, in the HIV wars. He's president of the Australian Drug Law Reform Foundation and president of the International Harm Reduction Association. He helped establish the first needle exchange syringe program and the first supervised injecting centre in Australia, when both were pre-legal. Um, and he then helped establish the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, etc. Would you please give a warm welcome to this panel? So Margaret lives near a, in a tiny hamlet uh, west of Lismore that we'll call Tabulum. Margaret is a single mum of two high school aged children and like everyone else, she needs her licence to work. She suffers from chronic pain. Uh, some of the medications that she had been on uh, led to sleepiness, led to tiredness, led to lack of concentration and led to her not enjoying her life with a lot of side effects. Um, she'd previously been under a mental health plan and sought counselling and therapy, but 12 months ago was prescribed cannabis as a medicine and her life changed. Even though it was costing her $260 per month, she uh, describes the cannabis drops as worth every cent. She sleeps a solid six hours per night. Her chronic pain and insomnia is completely in hand and there are no noticeable side effects. 
So, she, when she can, not quite afford the $260 a month, she lowers her use, and she knows that by lowering that use, many of the symptoms come back. On the 1st of August 2020, Margaret was driving to work when she was pulled over by the local police, and she tested positive to THC. She lost her licence for three months. As a result, she just lost her job cleaning at the local club. The reason she lost her job is because it was a drug-related offence and it was against the club's policy. She could have taken it to court and fought the three-month suspension, but there was no legal aid for that, and she was told her chances were not great before that particular magistrate. So she's lost her job. She's now on welfare with a work test, finding it very hard to pay the rent each month. She can't afford medicinal cannabis at all and is back on the prescription drugs that, make, that don't work, that have side effects, that make her tired, um, and eventually she hopes to get her licence back. What are the lessons from, from Margaret's story? These laws are insane. They are just crazy. There was no impairment by Margaret. She was no danger to anyone, and yet that is a true story of someone who these drug driving laws affect. And that's what we need to change. People who use cannabis as a medicine should never drive while they're the under, under the influence and weaving all over the road and a danger to the community. That's not what this is about. That's not what these laws are about. They're about stopping the state from taking away people's licences who are no risk to anyone in the community. So, Tom, would you like to start, tell us a little about what you're doing with Drive Change? Sure, thank you, David. Um, so, uh, and thank you everyone for, everyone for coming today. Uh, this is my first Mardi Gras, so it's really a pleasure to be up here with such amazing people. Um, so I guess I'll start with Honolly. So I started Honolly about a year and a half ago because cannabis has been a really important part of my life since I was a kid. Um, I grew up in America and you know started using cannabis at an early age. I, I realized fairly quickly that it wasn't just something for fun, but it could also be a medicine. And so fast forward to about 10 years ago, I moved here and met my wife and um, she has fibromyalgia and PTSD. And I remember the first time that we actually smoked a joint together. She said, wow, I feel good. I'm like, yeah, that's because you're high. Um, and she went, no, no, I feel really good. I feel healthy again for the first time. Um, and so, you know, that again triggered that for me. I have chronic back pain. I have bulged discs. Um, and so, you know, cannabis is an important part of my life. Um, so we started Honolly to, uh, I guess, help educate Australians on, on cannabis, as David said. Um, and we work with a lot of experts. That, so if you go to our website, you learn about cannabis mostly medicinal now because that's what's legal, but you always learn from an expert. So we have doctors talking about cannabis for anxiety, for depression, things like that. Um, and I saw David and I, I, I reached out to a contact at Harm Reduction Australia where David's an advocate. And I said, you know, this man's amazing. Um, you know, his, his message is amazing. I didn't know anything about it, but I'd love to be able to work with him. Um, and may, maybe said a few other things about him. Um, and Gino, who's in charge of Harm Reduction Australia, came back within an hour and said, David wants to talk to you. And, ooh, okay, uh, now I'm a little bit nervous because this, everyone knows this man and this is really exciting. Um, but we sat down with about five people and, and started, we said, you know, if we had one message, one voice, uh, it, it's really rare that you hear one voice from everyone. So, uh, and, and David has that platform. So if we had one message and one voice, we might be able to make a difference. And so we came up with Drive Change. And our message is to create equal rights for legal medicinal cannabis patients. And I'll explain that. So, um, you know, as David mentioned, and as you'll see, you come in and out of Nimbin today, um, there are police cars everywhere. If you test positive for THC in your system, and that's just a mouth swab, you will probably lose your license. Um, now, this is a problem for so many reasons. If you're, uh, first, firstly, um, you know, there is no cor uh, correlation between impairment uh, and presence of THC in your mouth. So it doesn't make any sense. And our road uh, drug driving laws are meant to make the road safer. There's also no evidence that mouth swabs have improved road safety. So that's just generally. Then if you're a patient, well, if you take medicinal cannabis, you cannot drive. Uh, this law is extremely discriminatory. So every other drug prescribed, if you get pulled over and mouth swabbed and test positive, 
as long as you're not impaired, you have a defense for presence. Cannabis is the only prescribed drug that does not have a defense. So it's a discriminatory law. Um, for everyone else who's not a patient, who doesn't use cannabis, this is a problem as well, because Australia is not about discrimination. We're about a community of people. So there are all these reasons that this law is just wrong. Um, now, with Drive Change, we've talked about legal medicinal cannabis patients. The, the whole group at Drive Change wants to see these laws change for everyone. It shouldn't just be for medicinal patients. If you use cannabis for whatever the reason, you should not be punished if you're not impaired. But we talked about what the lowest hanging fruit was, and that is for medicinal cannabis patients, so that's where we're starting. If we can win to, and change the law for me medicinal patients, that's one step towards changing the laws for everyone. Um, so just to wrap it up, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and how you can get involved. So um, to date, uh, Drive Change is a nonprofit organization. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to drivechangemc.org.au, um, and we'd love to, to you know, have everyone check in and, and join our socials. Um, but we've raised about $11,000 to date. Um, and as David will tell you, we were surprised that the industry isn't just throwing money at us. It's tax deductible. There are over 100 companies in the can legal cannabis industry, and we raised $11,000. So right now we're in fundraising mode. Um, David and I have spoken to the two uh, industry bodies, and we've had some real success, so we intend to see some more money coming in. Um, but we're, you know, David's already spoken at South Australian Parliament. We're going to be aiming to run more roundtables in Parliament across Australia. Um, we have webinars coming up. Um, we're going to do a cannabis and driving handbook that should be effectively the Bible for anyone to go to and learn about what the drug driving laws are with, with relation to cannabis. Um, we have some really good partnerships already. We have ambassadors like Fiona Patton um, and Tammy Franks from South Australia. Um, and we have a really exciting partnership that I hope we'll be able to announce in the next few weeks with uh, some ex-professional athletes, um, and we know that influencers uh, will and, and, and people's stories will be the thing to help change that law. So um, if you are a patient, if you're interested, if you want to share your story, please send us a message. We'd love to hear your story and share it. Um, yeah, and, and that's what we're doing at Drive Change. So we really want to create one message, politicians, uh, government, industry, patients, one message that is we need equal rights for medicinal cannabis patients. Thank you. Alex. Here, take the next one. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, David, for opening this session and reminding us that this law is fundamentally about individual people. And that's something we have to bear in mind constantly. Uh, yes, it's about principles, it's about uh, cost effectiveness, it's about all sorts of things. But fundamentally, this is something, these are laws first passed in the world in Victoria in 2004 and then metastasized, as we would say in medicine, a term we use when cancer spreads throughout the body, uh, uh, to all jurisdictions in Australia with the ACT being the, the most recent, and I think that was 2014. Um, and these laws uh, devastate people's lives for no good reason. Uh, why am I fundamentally, there are many, many reasons to uh, detest the roadside drug testing laws, but the most important reason for me, even though I'm not a lawyer, is because it grossly offends the principle, and the two Davids will correct me here, because this is legal territory, uh, it offends the Blackstone principle that better that 10 uh, guilty men go free than one innocent man is, man is punished. And I'm sorry that's the sexist uh, phrasing that was used in the 16th or 17th century. I think that was Blackstone. Uh, yeah. So... Um, it's clear that these laws uh, breach that principle head on because um, uh, the laws clearly punish very severely uh, drivers who are innocent. That is, they are not impaired when they're driving. They're innocent under the terms of the text of the legislation that somehow got through eight parliaments in Australia, but they're not guilty in any other way. 
the second reason why the, I find these laws so offensive is that they are based on voodoo science. That is to say, um, the three drugs which uh, are chosen, selected in seven of the eight jurisdictions, that is to say, uh, THC, cannabis, methamphetamine and MDMA, and thanks to David, also a fourth drug in New South Wales, cocaine, uh, the, the effect on driving ability is arguable. Uh, it's not black and white. Um, and there are prestigious, reputable authors who've looked at all the literature and who've, have said that the impairment in driving ability and also epidemiologically uh, is minimal or even less than that, uh, including some very reputable US authorities. Um, so I'm also uh, vehemently against this legislation on the grounds that it, it's, it's crap science. It's crap science because it argues or assumes that detectable presence of a drug is somehow equivalent to impairment without any test of impairment. Uh, it's also, they're, they're very expensive, Legis it's very expensive legislation to enforce. Um, it's not cost effective. There's no uh, proven benefit to road safety from having this legislation. I could go on, but there's, I think, uh, um, there's a caution in what I'd like to say now, and that is that in the attempt to get rid of this legislation in Australia, I very much hope that it won't be just getting rid of the cannabis component of the legislation, but getting rid of the, the legislation in toto in all eight jurisdictions. That should be, in my view, the aim. Uh, and if somebody wants to replace this legislation with some way of measuring impairment that is valid and reliable, uh, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that, uh, provided it's, it's measuring impairment and, and identifying some level uh, which uh, is unacceptable, uh, an unacceptably severe level of impairment. What do I do about this personally? Well, I was uh, very involved six or eight years ago in trying to get others to take this issue seriously. Uh, I'm not doing anything at the moment. I admire the guys who are doing this um, and support you unreservedly, and I can't wait to see these eight jurisdictions get rid of all of this legislation. Thank you. Um, terrific. The, uh, of, of great interest is that Tasmania, of the eight jurisdictions, does have a defence which says that if you under which says that if you have a prescription and you're using in accordance with that prescription, then uh, it is an absolute defence to the drug driving detection laws. Note that the road toll in in Tasmania has not skyrocketed as a result of this this radical left wing hippie <laughs> perverse legislation. David Shubridge. Oh, thanks, David. Look, um, uh, thanks to the panel. I'd, I'd like to start by acknowledging this is Bunjalung land and pay my respects to those elders past, present and emerging. And we're just, you know, a few short weeks after the 30th anniversary of the Death in Custody Royal Commission recommendations, 339, which the majority of which and the core ones have still not been implemented. And I'm sure many of you have been following through the trauma in First Nations communities as we've had seven deaths in just the last eight weeks, four of those in New South Wales. And we're talking here about justice and core issues about justice. Um, and we need to keep it at four of our mind that whenever we're talking about these kinds of issues, police abuse of powers, police discretion, core issues of injustice, it's First Nations communities that often get it toughest. And, and you would know that many First Nations communities are seeing literally all their licenses ripped out of communities by stupid laws like this then facing imprisonment and further criminal penalty, and that drives those appalling statistics. So I, I pay my respects to elders, and we must walk with First Nations peoples in reversing these kind of crap laws. Um, <laughs> but look, um, I've now spent more than 10 years in the New South Wales Parliament and um, fighting these 
particularly perverse laws. Uh, and I find it astounding the way in which a group of people can come together, actually hear the evidence, and then completely ignore it. Or worse still, go in exactly the opposite direction. And that's what parliaments around the country are doing on these drug driving laws. And, and I suppose uh, it's hard to point out where it is where, where it is most anti-intellectual and where it is most unjust. But I'll give you just one example. So um, uh, I, I drove in, just got here just before the panel actually, and, and I've been quite pissed off. This is now my nth Mardi Gras and not once have they stopped me and drug tested me. I, I, feel, a little bit, I feel a little bit singled out at this point because I heard that there was a, a cordon of steel around Nimbin on my way in, but they didn't stop me. But uh, when they do stop and they swab and they swab your mouth and then they go and test on this Draeger 5000 machine they have in their um, uh, police wagon. Um, interestingly, the Draeger 5000 that, um, that the New South Wales police use, it's standard. It's a standard one they use across the country. There's a little toggle where you actually have to turn off whether or not it picks up prescription drugs and benzodiazepines and they turn it off. They literally program it so it doesn't pick up prescription drugs. So it's only looking at, in New South Wales, the four drugs um, that David pointed out, four illegal drugs. Now, now, if you follow the evidence, and the evidence is pretty comprehensive around the world, that perhaps one of the, the class of drugs that is responsible for the greatest amount of road trauma after alcohol are prescription benzodiazepines. Um, you know, you would have known their, their sort of, their, their, their more common names, which are all escaping me right now. Valium. Valium. That's a good starting point. Um, uh, and a variety of those drugs, that perhaps some of the most commonly abused drugs on the, on the planet. And so uh, somebody can drive to one of those stops outside Nimbin or wherever the police have set up. They get their oral swab. They have a tiny amount, the smallest minuscule detectable amount of THC in their system. That gets popped into the, um, the Draeger 5000. They find, again, the smallest, tiniest detectable amount of THC in their system. They, they may have smoked a joint a week ago. No harm to anybody. Perfectly fine at driving. No, not the smallest amount of impairment. Goes off to a lab, comes back, bang. Licence gone for three months, six months, 12 months. And as David said, lose your job, lose your independence, lose your ability to travel, lose your ability to take family to medical appointments, lose your own capacity to go to medical appointments catastrophic impacts on your life. No impairment, no harm to anybody. The next car can come along. The driver can be zonked to the eyeballs on benzodiazepines. We know that that's a major cause for road trauma. They get road swabbed, they get swabbed, gets the green light, doesn't go to the drager, and they just get waved through. They just get waved through. Now, what kind of bizarre parliament sets up that kind of law? And has it happening tens of thousands of times throughout the year in somewhere like New South Wales, wanting to have that happen 200,000 times a year throughout New South Wales. It just beggars belief. So how have we been approaching it? Well, one of the first ways we wanted to approach it was to embarrass the coalition about the bizarre way in which, for example, they didn't test for cocaine. And if you have a look at the way they test for cannabis, it's overwhelmingly focused in southwest Sydney and up here on the north. They're the two places where the police smash uh, roadside drug testing, looking for people using cannabis. Southwest Sydney, the northern part of the state, these are, not, these are parts of the state which tend to have lower incomes, and, the, and the, the police and the coalition government are very happy with heavily policing those parts of the state. And yet when we had a look at the data on cocaine use, well, it kind of tended to be, this might surprise you, the eastern suburbs of Sydney and the north shore of Sydney. And, um, and we said, well, hang on. You're testing for cannabis, but not for cocaine. It's because you want to go soft on your own chosen drugs. And our theory was that if we bring in the sort of wealthy cocaine consuming coalition electorate into drug driving, stupid drug driving laws, we might start helping to build the case for change. And we shamed them after about, over about two years. And eventually they were shamed to the point of bringing cocaine into the roadside drug testing uh, regime. Um, um, and I think that's been important for pointing out the political hypocrisy, but it hasn't got us where we want to get. And so just a couple of months ago, there was another opportunity to deal with roadside drug testing in the parliament. And we moved an amendment to say that if somebody is taking cannabis for medical purposes and we didn't want to rely upon a prescription, 
because we thought that was a, an extraordinarily and pointlessly narrow um, pathway. But if you can prove that you're taking uh, cannabis for medicinal purposes, then you cannot be found guilty of the driving with the mere presence of cannabis in your system. And we said to the parliament, well, of course, we've got legal prescription cannabis. We know people are using cannabis for, for um, controlling pain. We know that it's particularly important for people with chronic pain and ongoing pain. Um, and, and what we also said is we're going to leave in the provision that exists next to this, this law, which says if you're driving with a level of any drug that actually impairs your driving, well, bang, you can lose your licence. And we said, well, if someone's driving with cannabis in their system and they're using it for medicinal purposes and it's actually impairing their driving, the laws are still there to protect other road users. We're getting rid of this mere presence thing. Get rid of it. Has no sense. We gave case after case after case that David pointed out. Anyhow, the coalition's response was, it's an illegal drug. We hate illegal drugs. It's an illegal drug. We hate illegal drugs. It's an illegal drug. We hate illegal drugs. We're not going to do anything. Um, and Labor, I think, finally have been now shamed to the point where they eventually said at the, during this debate, well, we see what you say. And they've been hearing it for like the better part of 10 years. We see what you say. And we're not going to support it now. But we will agree to review this, and there's definitely the opportunity now in New South Wales Parliament for the first time ever to have a rational committee inquiry and finally drag some MPs across and start talking science and sense and justice and decency on these roadside drug testing laws. And I can tell you now, we're going to see as soon as possible if we can have that opportunity at the end of the year and finally start pushing these, these laws outside of the Parliament. Thanks. And, uh, of course, what David says is quite right. Cannabis is, and what each of the speakers have said is quite right, cannabis has a special, is no longer just an illicit drug. It is also a prescribable drug, as many in this room would know. So the legal system can't cope. It's sort of turned it into some sort of schizophrenic frenzy because it's saying, well, it's illicit, but you can have it on prescription, so therefore it's an illegal drug. It screws their mind. Steve Bolt. Uh, thank you. Um, in my day job, I'm a lawyer, a solicitor in Lismore in a private practice, and I do stuff in the local court and various things in criminal law and so on. So um, I'll tell you what I tell lots of my clients, and that is the, there's some details about how the law works. That is, the drive with presence law is makes it an offence under the Road Transport Act to drive with the presence of THC and the few other drugs we've talked yeah, about. The detection level is, um, well, the, the process is the series, the swab and then the, uh, the, the roadside swab and then the, the taking of the sample. Uh, it comes back from the laboratory. If the laboratory test is positive, then you are charged or now given a, uh, a fine in the, in the mail. Um, the detection level is 10 nanograms of THC per 100 mil of saliva, so that's a quite low level. Um, the consequence is loss of licence for three months, uh, second offence, of license for six months, um, fines, uh, which obviously hurt, but the loss of license is the, uh, the critical, um, the painful bit for almost everybody. Um, there are many, many people like Margaret and other people who are, that David was talking about, many, many people who are uh, d literally devastated by this law. It is as stupid as it sounds. There is another law about um, driving under the influence of a drug or alcohol. That law is still on the books. Um, obviously, there are different laws about driving with um, concentrations of alcohol. The, um, the, the absence of science though, the absence of logic, the absence of anything except um, really cruelty, I think is the word, uh, the ideological um, obsession about illegal drug use um, translating into uh, this particular law or set of laws. Uh, it's the, um, for a long, long time, the government wanted to have uh, laws about drug driving. Um, years after uh, alcohol testing uh, became uh, successful and politically popular, popular with the general community, I think it's fair to say. Um, a lot of us uh, who lived through those times remember um, pretty wild uh, days uh, driving around with alcohol on board and other people driving us around with alcohol on board. But anyway, that was a, a good social change. Um, but for a long, long time after the, the convenience of police roadside testing was the thing that they loved um, about that. And they wanted to do the same thing for drugs. So the effort goes into testing, working out how you can get a reasonable kind of test from saliva rather than they don't want the cops to take blood samples for obvious reasons. Uh, something that's um, 
in terms of public health terms and, and um, uh, um, competence terms, anyone can do it, take a swab uh, and, and, and get some testing done. So that was where the focus was. No focus on what it means, no focus on the impairment. The science is, is there. There is all sorts of um, a bit conflicted um, evidence, but there's all sorts of evidence about how if um, cannabis in particular affects drug driving. There's all the, uh, the stories that many of us know from uh, long-term users who claim that they uh, have almost no impairment, no effect on their driving. It's probably right. It's probably right. Um, the uh, Lambert Initiative, uh, Sydney University Lambert Initiative is an institute that's looking at medicinal cannabis and so on. Just a couple of weeks ago uh, released a study that, it, uh, that showed just that. It showed that there was um, a, a sort of meta-analysis of about 80 odd studies from around the place. They just tried to work out how long is it? Can you answer the question, how, lo how long is it safe to drive after you use cannabis? The answer is can't say, don't know. Bit difficult to say that can't answer the question, but maybe eight hours at the at the at the far end, maybe two or three hours. Really, it depends. The um, what is impaired is just some aspects of driving, so it doesn't affect how fast people drive. A whole lot of things are not affected. Apparently, people are a bit slow. But I think we all know that. Um, but yes, in terms of. Um, uh, the overall impact, the, uh, the evidence was that people who are long-term users um, and smoked a joint uh, almost had ha no detectable impact on their capacity to drive. So if, if that's the evidence, if that's truthful, and let's do the study over again, let's work out if that's right, but if that's the truth, what does it matter what we can measure by convenience of a police test on the side of the road and do 100,000 of them a year? What does that mean? What does that matter? Why don't we look at what is really going to make an impact, if any, on how people drive. If you're a stoner and you smoke every day and it's safe to drive when you're stoned, okay. Why don't we, why don't we allow that? Why don't we have a, a, um, a big S on your, on your driver's license? You register as a stoner. <laughs> they wave you through. They wave you through. Let's look at, the, let's look at what we're trying to achieve there has been zero impact on road safety, zero impact on deaths on the road, on trauma, on accidents, zero impact as a result of the, how many years have you been doing this for? Seems like a long time, eight or 10 years, I don't know, long time. And no uh, positive impact on the community, many, many, many multiple negative impacts on important members of the community, ordinary people who are, who are being, um, having their lives trashed by this stupid law. Robbie. Thanks. Test here. Uh, I'm not Fiona Patton, as uh, David said earlier. I'm sort of uh, her partner. Uh, Fiona's a member of parliament in, in the Victorian parliament, and um, uh, she's been sort of, you know, dealing with cannabis issues for ever since she got elected in 2014. It probably by way of background, I think it's always helpful for that with politicians because one of the big issues that we have is that many politicians who smoke cannabis don't admit it. Um, and uh, this morning, I think Kate Fairman came out and said, you know, that she had been a long time smoker and user and uh, Fiona's the same in Melbourne. She says that uh, she's been a lifetime smoker and goes home and has a joint after parliament. Um, I don't know about David's uh, drug history, but... <laughs> <laughs> we'll let that later. But, but the... I'm not going to pretend I never inhaled. No. no. <laughs> In fact, David didn't exhale. <laughs> <laughs> we estimate that in, in the Victorian Parliament that there are up to 20% of politicians who have used or do use cannabis but don't admit to it. And it's a big issue because if they did, it would change people's attitudes a lot more than they are at the moment. And, uh, you know, maybe that's something for later. But as I say, Fiona was also the first uh, sex worker to be elected to parliament in Australia. And she has that kind of background, you know, where she's quite open about it. Um, my background is that I was arrested for growing 600 marijuana plants in 1970. And uh, in the days following that in Cooma Jail, I... Uh, you know, thought that uh, I would pledge part of my life to reorganising drug laws if I ever had the opportunity. And uh, as Fiona's spouse, I do. So that's why I'm here. Um, look, just uh, looking at what's happened, I I'd like to say that there's a ray of sunshine here on the horizon, I think, in Victoria. 
Um, notwithstanding the good work that David and Kate have done in New South Wales, uh, you know, Fiona's busy down there doing the same thing, but getting a slightly different response. Um, the Victorian government has invested pretty heavily in a medical cannabis scheme. I mean, they did this, you know, years ago. I think was it 2016. The feds kind of changed cannabis on the, from the schedule eight, nine to eight. And the Victorian government drew up a plan, an industry plan, that would make them the, the leader in medical cannabis in Australia. And, you know, they kind of thought in the world, I think, you know, at that stage. Now, you know, how the mighty have fallen. I mean, nothing's really happened much in the last couple of years. But they did have that. And they, you know, they've got farms growing cannabis down there. Uh, you know, there's uh, grow houses and, you know, they're doing stuff. But uh, it'll never work because the recipients of the campaign, of, of, of the legislation, that's cannabis, med medical cannabis users, cannot drive a car to go and pick up their medicine from the doctor or the hospital or the pharmacy or fucking where else, you know. So, I mean, David mentioned this this morning, and I think it's a really important point that this is the basic inconsistency in this whole thing, is that state governments have invested in medical cannabis schemes, but they're not allowing people to drive to get their stuff. I mean, it just can't work. It's like with all the other drugs we've mentioned before. You know, if you've got a scheme to, to, to prescribe opiates and benzodiazepines and, you know, hypnotics and all the rest of it, you have to allow people to be able to go and get it, to drive a car to get it. And the, the theory is that they are better drivers for having the medicine, I guess, which would be probably the same with cannabis. So, I mean, Fiona brought this to the attention of the government and said, you, you're never going to have a ca proper cannabis scheme here while you have... Uh, you know, criminalised driving under the, w with cannabis in your system. So she did exactly what uh, I think um, David's done, which is to, you know, put forward a, a couple of amendments. I mean, her first amendments were to the Road Safety Act. She knew that that would never get up, um, but I think that was sort of like softening them up a bit. Then she put forward a private member's bill um, and said to the government, if you don't support this, you're going to look pretty silly. I guess much the same arguments as David put to the government, you know, that for all the same reasons. Um, but she did push them and, you know, uh, uh, quite a bit and, uh, you know, in the end when they said, no, we're not going to vote for your private members bill because governments, uh, you know, reckon they're elected by people so therefore they're the ones that are going to put forward legislation. They're not going to let um, independents or the Greens or the opposition write their legislation for them. So, you know, they said go to buggery, we're not going to go with this. So uh, at that point she turned around, I think she lobbied them a bit more and, you know, did a few things and then said, well, how about a task force to look at this that's made up of some eminent people? Um, and in the end the government agreed to that. And uh, in setting up that task force, she gave me a few figures here, um, they, um, you know, that she's saying that, that, that in Victoria now there are a hundred medicinal cannabis products that doctors can prescribe. And that to this time, I think uh, there's been 100,000 written throughout Australia, TGA approvals, so maybe 30,000 in Victoria. So it's sort of getting there. Um, but uh, in, in, in announcing this, uh, what is it, the Medical Cannabis Safe Driving Group, which had a dozen, I think, fairly hard, heavy hitters, you know, some people from the department, the medical, uh, the health department were on it. Uh, it's a fairly august committee uh, or, or task force. And um, in announcing this, uh, Minister Sean Lean got up in the upper house. And uh, Sean Lean, by the way, is the only government minister ever in Victoria to have a ponytail. And... Um, <laughs> Less prior to the... Uh since 1901. Since 1901, that's correct. Before then, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, mind you, it, it was a grey ponytail as well, so that says up something else, but it was only small. Anyway, um, he, um, he got up in the, in the upper house and said that he would, uh, something like, you know, that the government will support Ms Patton in what she's doing and will not let the users of medicinal cannabis suffer discrimination or hardship or something like that. So that was a fairly positive statement from the government. I mean, they didn't have to make that statement. Um, and, uh, you know, Fiona's pretty happy with that and thinks that they actually will go ahead, unless this task force, you know, comes down with some really radically bad findings. But when you see who's on it, it's hard to see that happening. So uh, I think there is a, um, you know, array of uh, sunshine here on the horizon. Can I just say also that um, 
just thinking forward a bit here, if, for example, Victoria does go ahead and, you know, changes the laws so that you can have a certain amount of uh, cannabis or THC in your blood, uh, that would probably affect the whole of Australia. Um, it would be difficult for other states to not go with that, um, especially uh, given, I was talking to Alex about this this morning, Section 92 of the Constitution, uh, which sort of guarantees the free trade across state borders of a product that's legal in one jurisdiction into another. And I know a bit about this because uh, when Fiona and I were lobbying politicians uh, back in the 90s over X-rated non-violent erotic videos, um, Canberra was the base for that industry and uh, it, 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 was, it was the only jurisdiction in Australia where that was legal. You couldn't sell them from any other state in Australia. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but the reason, the reason that you could do that was that uh, Section 92 basically said if a product is legal in one jurisdiction you can send it to another and it's legal to possess that article or that object or in, in another jurisdiction, you can possess it. Western Australia tried to change that. They introduced the law which said you to ban X, the possession of X-rated films, but they rescinded that after about six months because they realised that that would fail probably in the High Court. So what we're thinking is that if someone has, uh, they go to, you know, someone from Nimbin here goes to Melbourne, they can't sleep because of the trams. They go to the doctor the next day to get some medicinal cannabis to make them sleep. They bring it back to Nimbin it's in their system, in the blood, and also in their pocket, in a vial. Um, how does that work? I mean, we think that Section 92 would say that the police can't do anything about it, because it's... But there'd probably be other minds on this panel here better than me to might uh, talk about that in the future, but we're thinking that that's the way that that might go. Um, so, anyway, that, that's where I, we think we're at. We're pretty positive about the future. Thanks very much, Robbie. And so, so there is action in Victoria. There has already been uh, a passing of the Tasmanian legislation six years ago. And there is a bill before South Australian Parliament. And Tom and I, or mainly me, I think, Tom organised it, addressed um, parliamentarians in South Australia about this and got a good, got a good reception, I think. I, I think the only comment I would make to that before we open it up for questions and to, to the panel is this. That really, after listening to that, it reinforces to me that this is not about road safety. This is not about health. This is about prohibition. This is about the forces of prohibition fighting back against medicinal cannabis, fighting back against any loosening of the cannabis laws. This is about saying no. You know, you might have your little bills and your TGA successes, but we, the forces of the state, the police, are going to put a, sp a, a spike in your tyres and make sure that, the canna that cannabis use is punished. If it's not punished by possession, if it's not punished by self-administration laws, if it's not punished in the, by the fact that you're smoking in your own home and no one knows, we'll get you on your way to wor work. We'll get you on the way to Mardi Gras. We'll get you no matter what because we believe in prohibition. And I think that that, at its heart, is the only rational explanation for why we have these laws continuing throughout Australia. So, with that happy statement, questions? Um, and we have a roving mic. Can we have a little bit of light on the audience, please? I, I, I'm hoping just to get a comment on it, because you know, it's, it's clear that the legislation was passed as a road safety harm reduction um, legislation that was turned into zero tolerance and another arm of prohibition. But there's been, early on in the Northern Rivers, the police were releasing statistics on our roads of their, their operations. And often the statistics were like 17% found with drugs in their system um, the, the, and around the 20% marks. Then one was quantitatively poor came out um, where I think it was only 60 people were tested and 20 positives. I remember, I think it was a current affair that ran with it going up to 33% of Northern Rivers drivers are driving with drugs in their system. and then. You could also look at that and then go look at the fatalities in the area. And I think it was around, and you might um, be able to shed more light on it than me, David, but I think it was around five and a half, six percent fatalities had drugs in their system. 
So you could go quantitatively, if 33% of drivers are only creating 6% of the fatalities, they're actually five times safer drivers than those without drugs in their system. So I think it's an interesting spot where maybe we could see more pressure on releasing statistics, but this also opens up a, a, a can of worms. It's either that it was random or random testing, which it doesn't appear to be, and it's more targeted testing, so that skews the statistics. But then if you bring it back to a harm reduction situation, then the police are pressured then to actually start testing drivers who they think won't have drugs in their system to skew the statistics to make it appear as though it's harm reduction. Yep. I just wonder about your comment. How could um, statistics be drawn on without crossing a line and then to be looking like you're promoting people driving with drugs in their system? It's, yep. it, it's blurry. For so. myself, there's only one statistic that really counts, and that is with 200,000 tests, 220,000 this year, has there been any reduction in the road toll as a result? Really, that's the only statistic that counts. And the answer clearly is, well, nobody's even claiming that. Not even the most zealous supporter of drug driving is claiming that it's having an impact on the road toll. So that, that to me, is the statistic that counts. As for randomness, well, it just so happens by random chance that there was buses at every entry into Nimbin today. Yeah. Bullshit. Well, look, I, I think um, I, I've had this argument with the Centre for Road Safety um, repeatedly. They will often get rolled into Parliament to try and justify the crap truck driving laws. And the data that they have is the number of serious accidents or fatalities where drugs were involved. Um, and what that means is, when you actually drill down to what they say, that means that where there's a serious accident or a fatality, that a blood sample is taken and there's the mere presence of drugs. And so I say to them, well, if you're serious about the data, tell us what the actual concentration of drugs were so we can see if they actually had any involvement at all or are likely to have had any involvement at all in road trauma or fatalities, and they say they're not going to do that. They're not going to gather the data. That's not what they do. They just do the mere presence of stuff. So, you know, it's one of those junk data in, junk results out, junk laws follow. You've got someone? Alex? Thank you. I want to put this in the framework of a bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that the reduction of road crash deaths in Australia in the last half century has been an unprecedented public health triumph. Um, in 1970, 30 Australians were killed out of every 100,000 on the roads in that year. In 2019, the most recent year for which figures are available, that figure of 30 is now down to 4.7. So there's been an 85% reduction in road crash deaths in that period. 1971 was my first year as a doctor and I was working at the Alfred Hospital in Paran in Melbourne and they were building a new, what was then a new tower block. And one day I was walking through an area and the architect of the new tower block was demonstrating a scale model of the, what the tower block would look like. So I had a chat with him and he told me the following. He told me that the tower block had been designed before safety belts, the tower block had come into operation, was coming into operation after safety belts were already implemented. And uh, that had transformed the use of uh, of the need for hospital beds. Each floor had, for memory, 40 beds, and one whole floor of that tower block was going to be devoted to, originally, was going to be devoted to a type of surgery uh, that is needed for people who have broken the middle third of their skull. This is the fracture that John Gorton got in a Spitfire accident in World War II, former Prime Minister, you might remember. Um, and it requires orthopaedic surgeons who fix joints, the other kind of joints, um, bones. Uh, uh, it requires dental surgeons and it requires neurosurgeons. Those three specialties work together when people have broken that middle third of their jaw. Because of safety belts, people were no longer being thrown out of their vehicles in a road crash and 
the number of cases of what's called the middle third fracture of the skull had sharply dropped and now instead of needing 40 beds, they only needed four. I was an immediate convert to preventive health. Just imagine what the saving in life, the saving in pain, the saving in dollars, whatever you want to say, uh, since then, multiply that by every hospital in Australia. Just imagine what a benefit that's be. And that's the power of preventive health. Uh, now, it wasn't just safety belts that brought us down from 30 to 4.7 per 100,000 per year, but safety belts was dropped the road crash toll by about a third uh, across the country. And then there was airbags and there are many other features as well. Most of the things that were done in Australia between 1970 and now on the roads were harm reduction. It's harm reduction that was the huge beneficiary. Not everything was harm reduction. A lot of it was harm reduction. And so I want you to remember that because what happened between 1970 and now is the population went up, car ownership went up, and car utilisation went up. The number of kilometres every passenger and driver travelled every year went up until the last year after year until the last few years. So it wasn't the reduction of use of motor vehicles that brought about this reduction, it was harm reduction. So this is incredibly powerful and it's our lack of commitment to harm reduction which is the root cause of our whole problem with drug policy in Australia. And there's no better illustration of it than this nonsense here where we have laws which uh, ignore completely uh, what should be the paramount aim and that is to reduce the harm from drugs rather than just to reduce the use of drugs. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. So, um, I don't smoke marijuana and I don't take it. Um, this weekend I've felt high just from smelling everybody else's marijuana, um, which is great. Um, I have two daughters. One's about to get her um, peas. And I have a friend whose um, son had psychosis from marijuana. Are there different types of marijuana that can make you impaired on the road? Um, you know, I feel like there are, personally. Um, and I feel like there needs to be some kind of test to show how alert somebody is. Like they were talking in America, there's a test. Yeah. Because I know for a fact that some people will smoke heaps of bongs, go out there, off their face and drive, and they are impaired. That does worry me as a mother. Um, I think that so where do, where's the line here? Well, I think it's really clear where the line is. There wouldn't be a person in this room who would argue that those who are impaired should be able to drive on our roads. No one is arguing in favour of driving while impaired. The drug driving detection scheme detects at levels so far below impairment and for so long uh, that, that it is nonsensical. So maybe we need something like on your website, I don't know, and we, we can change those. Well, I think if you look, for example, at the Drive Change website, it makes it absolutely clear that, we un that, that impairment is not something uh, that anybody is seeking legal change on. And I feel I, like I just, a, just a sec, uh, yeah. the politicians continually say that the reason for these drug driving laws is to stop people driving while impaired. But that is just untrue. Yeah. The purpose of these laws is not to stop people driving while they're impaired because there is a law for driving while impairment that remains and is clear. And I think everyone's made that absolutely crystal clear it, certainly, I have, and I think everyone here has every time we speak. David? I'd, I'd just like to see a level where, yeah. you know, if you go over a certain level, yeah, you, you, you have...
put other lives in danger on the road as well. Well, I, I wish you were legislating because um, that would be a great test, wouldn't it? If there's a there level at which balance. you're impaired, yeah. if there's a level at which you're impaired, <clears throat> let's find a level that is a kind of best fit across the population, which shows where impairment kicks in and tests for that level. And we don't have to go a mile to look for legislation that does that. Like we already do it and we already understand it and we're already quite comfortable with it when it comes to alcohol. But like um, it was initially 0 0.08, it's now 0 0.05 as the science has moved on. And we accept in society that that's a level which taken across the population will tend to impair your driving to a level where you actually shouldn't be on the roads. And if you're a really inexperienced driver, well, the level is lower, 0 0.02. And I think none of us are, I'm quite certain, all of us would want to see any impaired driver, drug impaired driver off the road. And for me, I don't care if the drug that someone is consuming is legal or illegal. If they're impaired by drugs, they should be off the road. The laws should test on impairment. And let's, instead of having these pointless laws that test for the smallest detectable amount, let's find that level um, for, when, for cannabis and let's put in laws that mirror the hugely successful harm reduction laws we've done on alcohol. Um, thank you so much for your, it's a great insight, this panel, I'm loving it. Um, one question about the Draeger 5000, I, I find it so interesting that we can switch off a benzo benzodiazepine switch and not measure that, um, is something I'm going to look into, but is there any levels of impairment which are associated with benzodiazepines and are they measurable, similar to alcohol, and what other um, drugs are measurable with the Draeger 5000, I feel like I'm talking about a science fiction story here, but then the Draeger 5000 obviously can test a lot of drugs. Um, and if we can test impairment levels for certain drugs, even if they're not illegal, if the level of testing of the cannabinoids in that person is very low and above 10 nanograms per mil, which is extremely low, it's actually 0.1 if you're talking about 100 mil, so 0.1 of a nanogram per milliliter of saliva, if it's detected, great, it's been detected. But if that person's, say, um, positive for a much higher level of benzodiazepines, which we know are impairing them, or a much higher level of um, cocaine or um, heroin or any other opiates, shouldn't those drugs be chastised first? Shouldn't that be the cause of impairment rather than the minor level of cannabinoid detection rather than impairment? I think I, think I can answer that question, yes. It, it should be. Um, the interesting thing is if you're involved in a fatal or a serious car accident in New South Wales, then um, you uh, can be taken to the hospital, or if they suspect you're under the influence, you can be taken to the hospital and forced to give a blood test. Happens literally hundreds of times every week in New South Wales. So what happens then is that blood test is given to a forensic pathologist who makes an assessment in accordance with the police facts, you know, weaving all over the road, driving like an idiot, couldn't, uh, staggering, bloodshot eyes, etc. And they form a professional conclusion, an opinion conclusion, that you are driving under the influence. So we actually already have that system for prescription drugs, illicit drugs, all illicit drugs, um, and that conclusion is reached by a science, not faultless, but a pretty good scientific method uh, based on that. So in effect, for driving under the influence, we already have that, and it is so crazy to just be testing. But worse than that, someone could be, have a minuscule amount of THC and a lot of Valium in their system and still go down for the THC, but not for the Valium, the same person on the same day. So it is particularly crazy. I don't, I don't know what other drugs Draeger can pick up. I'm not sure if any of the panel does. I'm not a salesperson for Draeger 5000, um, <laughs> but it does, I think there's, a, there's, there's quite a long list of drugs that it's able to pick up. Um, it sticks in my mind because it's just such a sort of evil and efficient sounding instrument, the Draco 5000. Um, but it definitely picks up benzodiazepines and a series of drugs in addition to what is being tested for by the New South Wales Police. And, you know, if we're talking about road safety and you can test for drugs that are impairing people's driving and we don't do it, it sums up just how bizarrely political this is, how it's not about road safety. This is a war on a few drugs not sold by pharmaceutical companies that these certain politicians don't like. And of course, the problem for THC is that it is fat soluble. So it's gonna stay in your system for so much longer. 
I've said this story before, but if you're a tradie on a Friday night and you want to go out and get plastered, you can spend a couple of hundred bucks on alcohol. You can uh, take some cannabis, but you might well be tested positive on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. Or, of course, for about a tenth of the price of all of that, you can do ice and you're likely to be clear by Monday morning. That's the insanity of the system. That is what it is actually encouraging people to do. Can I say something else about the Draga 5000? It's such a lovely name. Uh, important to remember that the, it's, it's pointless. The, the point about it's so annoying personally to me because I hear this story all the time. Uh, half the two people who are, who, sorry, just to be clear, you stopped at the roadside, they take a swab, yes, you're positive, come and do the Draga thing. They take a sample, put in the, some of it in the machine. Whatever happens then does not matter. As in, if you're positive, you are given a direction not to drive for 24 hours. If you're negative, off you go. But either way, that sample is sent off to the lab and you end up, 97% of the time, having uh, the charge of drive with presence. So why the hell are we worrying about this Drago 5000 machine at all if it's just a random allocation of who's going to be disqualified for driving for 24 hours? OK, why? Because you had a joint three days before that. OK. Road safety or what? Uh, yeah, I mean, why do it? It just confuses everybody. The, the point I think about road safety and legislation and rules about road safety really shouldn't be about the law making us do the right thing. It should be about the law teaching us to be better road users, being a bit more thoughtful, more mindful. People who smoke joints for the first time in their life do not go out, drive a car, get in a car and drive within two hours of smoking their first joint. That is not my experience, not anyone in this room's experience of novice users of cannabis. People who've been smoking every day for 30 years might have a joint, walk out the front door and drive their car. Okay, maybe that's not the best behaviour. Let's talk about that behaviour and work out what is right and what is wrong about that behaviour and have a legal framework that makes some kind of sense instead of making everybody just so pissed off with it all that they just think it's all nonsense. Tell everyone will tell you, people will tell you, oh, it doesn't affect me, oh, I'm okay to drive. It doesn't make people stop and think. We should have laws that make people stop and think enough about their practice, about their conduct, but that's what we should be doing and not punishing people who are doing absolutely nothing wrong in terms of road safety and the way they drive their vehicle. Thank you. Alex, uh, briefly. Firstly, uh, the combination of alcohol and cannabis definitely impairs driving ability more than either substance on its own. Uh, and that is, a, that is a problem, something that we should be mindful of, something we should warn ourselves, remind ourselves and warn others about. Secondly, measuring <coughs> blood levels for drugs apart from cannabis is not a particularly good idea uh, in terms of therapeutic drugs, prescribable drugs, because there are hundreds of prescribable drugs with different tendencies to uh, increase the risk of uh, a road crash. Uh, drugs get added to the market every year, drugs get withdrawn from the market every year, and it's impossible to keep up with testing all of those drugs and working out what the appropriate uh, blood levels ought to be, uh, or other biological measurable. Uh, what re really is needed is a valid and reliable uh, uh, test of impairment that can be done at the roadside. That's what we really need. Uh, there's been work going on at uh, Swinburne Tech for some years on looking at eye movements as um, a way of measuring impairment. Uh, and they're working on that and they've written some papers on that um, until that work is finished and we can be absolutely sure that that's uh, uh, valid and reliable, then uh, I think we have to, to wait. And it's anxious. It'd be much better if all of this was solved by uh, accurate roadside drug testing, which at the moment we don't have. The ro existing roadside uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, roadside impairment testing, the existing roadside impairment testing is not very reliable. We don't have time for further questions, unfortunately, but the panel will be hanging around and we're happy to uh, speak to you afterwards. Thank you so much for coming and for taking interest in this important cause. Um, and we will uh, see you all at the rally tomorrow where part of the march is to be changing the drug driving laws. Thanks very much.